So uh, I think yeah, I was going to uh, say let's start recording, and, and I'm glad it's being recorded. So, um, so first, uh, uh, Bing Lu is going to uh, speak today. He's a distinguished professor at the University of Illinois in Chicago. Um, he received a PhD in AI from the University of Edinburgh. Uh, before joining UIC, he was a faculty member at the National University of Singapore. His research includes interest in lifelong and continual learning, sentiment analysis, and natural language processing, as well as data mining. He's a recipient of the 2018 ACM SIG KDD Innovation Award. His papers have received Test of Time Awards. Uh, and he is an ACM Fellow, a AAAI Fellow, and an IEEE Fellow. Uh, with that, I'll let you uh, begin, Dave. Oh, uh, you're muted, by the way. Sorry. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, thank you very much for the uh, uh, invitation as well. Um, so today I'm gonna talk about this uh, topic which is called the learning on the job and the, in the open world. So this is basically a combination of ideas and the, today's talk is more sort of at a high level and uh, there are not lots of details, but a little bit. And uh, um, if you're interested in, you can read um, some papers. So um, in the classic or traditional machine learning, um, have this particular paradigm, which we call uh, the isolate single task learning. Uh, what happens when you have a task and uh, you have a set of data, and then you give it to the machine learning algorithm, and the algorithm will produce the model. And then basically, if the model is satisfactory, and then you send it for application. And then during the application, it's gonna work on the particular task which is intended for. Um, however, the, the situation is changing in the last um, couple of years. Um, the increasingly the AI agents, AI systems um, being deployed to real world, which are dynamic. It's not like traditional, uh, very narrow domains. So they really have to face the real world, um, which is lots of things happening, and lots of things are changing, and lots of things that are never seen before uh, during learning. So this basically, um, show some sort of weakness of this traditional model. The first one is the closed world assumption, um, essentially the idea assumption um, basically says there's something new happening uh, when you come to testing and when you come to the real world application. But uh, this is not true in the dynamic world. And also the model is fixed, obviously it's not a model is fixed during application. So it's, you can see this, this is basically the linear process. And uh, when you have a model, go for the application and then the model is basically not revised and nothing will be changed until you do next sort of batch training. And as also this learning process is continu it's not continuous and uh, it's basically then there's no knowledge accumulation. So, and uh, then you need a huge amount of labeled training data uh, in order to produce a good model. And of course, this is basically says uh, it's only suitable for um, well-defined and very narrow domains and the tasks. Uh, let me first define what I mean by closed world assumption. Um, this is just a, a very simple definition. Um, so in the traditional machine learning, we have the training data, we have the test data, and uh, we have the training, um, the classes, the labels, L2, LT, L1 to LT. And uh, the test, we also pretty much have the same set of labels. And of course, we don't really have to exactly have the same set of labels, but it has, the test has to be a subset of the training labels, the training labels. And so it basically says nothing new happens. However, this is a problem. And the problem is if you can't detect anything new, then there's no way you can learn new stuff by yourself, okay? And uh, in the open world, which is uh, very much the case in most of the applications actually, is the test has something which is not in training. So essentially it says we have some unseen or out of distribution data and uh, which the system has to detect. Because if you classify those um, out of distribution or unseen data or unseen classes um, to the existing classes or labels, then you're making a big mistake. So of course, this is the, this is the case in, in all kinds of applications. In general, we say it's unseen. Of course, you can also be 
uh, sort of concept drifting, uh, which is in, um, normally used in a stream data. Um, we humans never learn in isolation or from scratch, and we always learn based on our knowledge learned in the past, and we learn continuously, and also we accumulate whatever we have learned in the past, and uh, hopefully we can use that knowledge to help us to learn better, to learn more, and to learn quickly. And uh, of course, we also are very comfortable in learning in this kind of uh, open environment. There are lots of unknowns which are happening, and how do we handle these unknowns, and how do we learn from the unknowns? And this will be an interesting, a very interesting topic. And that's essentially um, how do we learn on the job and after the formal training. And uh, so human being is very good at this. Okay, well, after our education in schools or in universities or whatever, and uh, you go to work and then you keep learning. Okay, keep learning and you get more and more knowledgeable. Um, so our goal, of course, is trying to imitate this kind of a human learning capability. And we call it online, lifelong, or continual learning in the open world. And of course, we can also say simply just like learning on the job. And essentially after the uh, model deployment or uh, during applications and uh, create and the goal, the final goal, of course, is to create a machine that is able to do it. And uh, um, it is own initiative. So not being sort of forced to do it, passively doing it. So how to do this actively in the process of application. So not in the process of model building because there are so many algorithms for just to learn um, with the batch uh, model building. How do we learn that in the process of application? So here's the roadmap. And the first thing um, I'm gonna talk about two motivating examples then I'm gonna define it and then there'll be uh, quite a few topics which is related to this uh, uh, particular problem. Um, so, I worked on this self-driving car for, uh, for a year, uh, one half a year, and I uh, got really first-hand experience. And uh, I find this is extremely hard problem. And at the beginning, I thought this was not so terribly hard, but then I um, realized after try it, and it's just extremely hard. Um, so basically my feeling is you can't reach this human level of uh, driving with the rules and the offline batch training, just impossible to cover all the corner cases. And there are so many things unknown in the sort of, in the real world, on the roads. And uh, when I was working on this particular problem, and uh, I sort of think about the algorithm all the time. And uh, so I probably got some algorithm at night, and then next day I go to drive to work, and then, oh, okay, this algorithm doesn't work in this particular situation. That algorithm doesn't work in that kind of situation. So it's basically endless problems. So it's essentially it's an endless problem. And then the problem is that the system has to somehow, um, if you want the system to work really well, it has to adapt, to learn adapt and the continuously, and it has to interact with humans and there was environment. You know, that's essentially what we talk about, the, the open world, the changes, the, the unknowns. And I have a real, real experience, which is, uh, um, of course, I have many sort of real experiences. This is a, a experience which is uh, uh, quite interesting. Um, when we're testing a real sort of self-driven car on the road, and once the road was actually quite, uh, uh, quite empty, and there was only a few cars, and the, the suddenly the guy, the, the, basically the car stopped and they refused to move. And we didn't we sort of look around everywhere. We didn't, we don't, we didn't really see anything, um, you know, was something obstructing or there's something which is dangerous. And the, the car was in the middle of the road. There was, the position was pretty good in front of us, nothing. And then when we go back to debug, then we find there's a small stone on the road because one of the sensor detect that stuff and just don't move. <clears throat> so now we have this question. So why can't the car tell us what the problem was? Okay, it doesn't, it doesn't matter in what language, it could be just machine language or whatever, give them a sign. But those problems are sort of solvable. Okay, you can tell what happened, all right? It's not the system cannot tell in, ma in many cases. Right? And also, um, even the system can tell the user um, what happens, even system does not tell, now, why can't we just tell the car to go ahead, right? To use and to use natural language or use some other means of interaction. And then this particular 
So the instruction, instruction will be a piece of uh, supervisory information that car can learn from this particular situation. And hopefully next time when they sort of encounter the same kind of uh, situation, uh, it's not gonna stop anymore. Right. So this kind of thing happens all the time on the road. And uh, so can we make the system sort of become more autonomous? And uh, in the process, we also want the system to interact with people. Because without interaction, of course, car doesn't really know what, what the problem is and uh, what kind of, is this situation dangerous or not dangerous? And whether they should go ahead or we should just basically uh, stop there and uh, let's basically let uh, humans to take over. And this is pretty much similar situation. I had a little bit of experience with a chatbot as well. And uh, again, the chatbots is, um, but the, dynam the environment is also very dynamic, just like cars. And then the cars, you can have nice roads, I mean, highways, you don't really have lots of sort of uh, crisscrossing, there's people going around and uh, with people, with all kinds of things going around. And uh, for, the, um, for the chatbots, it's pretty much similar because we really have no idea what people is gonna say. No matter how do you train your system and how many rules you write, and you are not going to cover everything people might say. And so that's completely a dynamic and open world. Okay. So in that case, and again, we have the problem of training. We can't get the engineer to train this guy forever, right? Every time there's something um, this thing doesn't understand, or just do it wrongly, just say, probably if you don't understand, just say you don't know. But is it possible to get chatbot to learn something in the process? to learn something in the process, especially at this, um, now we have uh, um, this environment with one chatbot with millions of users. And uh, I'm pretty sure the chatbot can learn something from this millions of users and to become much more sort of uh, knowledgeable and uh, able to answer questions or, or able to chat um, as time goes by. So it's basically the same message, um, the chatbots must learn during chatting. Of course, you can also learn from other sources. For example, go search on the web and um, probably learn something from, from documents. But the essential thing is uh, it has to learn on the job. You cannot just say you stop and then you know, go back, the, the engineer go to collect the data and then somebody label the data and then um, do, uh, do another training and then basically get another version or get another release. And the kind of system um, that is automatically in order to be uh, completely, not necessarily complete, but pretty much autonomous. Right. So, uh, so here I would like to stress this particular concept of learning on one's own initiative. This does not really mean um, unsupervised learning. Okay? It just means the agent can um, obtain supervision by it its own kind of actions through its own active sort of communication and the chatting or this process and the, could be talking to the human or talking to other agents and uh, to get feedbacks from the environment. Of course, the, if the agent want to get some feedback from the environment, the agent has to have an internal evaluation system to, to know what kind of things is good, what kind of things not good. So I personally, I believe the supervised learning, unsupervised learning is mainly for low level kind of learning. For example, you learn features, you learn those very, kind of fairly low level things. And then you also have to have, if you want to learn something um, fairly high level, you, may, you must have sort of very good uh, evaluation system. For example, we human beings definitely have a lot of sense, sense and we evaluate certain things good for us in order to survive and what certain things not good for us. And also if we want to do unsupervised learning, it will learn very, very slowly, okay? It doesn't really learn quickly as supervised learning. And as humans, we, we don't really learn everything um, ourselves. I guess most of our knowledge, probably major part of our knowledge are passed down from the previous generations. And then uh, we learn from instructions or learn from different kind of supervision. Um, at the concept level, I think supervised learning is required. So the, the key issues, of course, is how do we obtain this supervised information? So essentially learning on one's own initiative essentially says the agent has to somehow initiate um, some kind of interaction in order to um, uh, produce some sort of, uh, in order to gain some supervised information. 
Of course, the supervisor is also um, important um, because in order to, for our agent to communicate with humans, um, the agent can't just learn unsupervised thing by itself. For example, you, I mean, agent cannot group the cats and tigers together, just give it a weird name, one, two, three, or whatever a weird name, because in that case, you, you can't really communicate with people. Another thing, of course, a lot of things in the world are artifacts are created by people. So in order to learn, and the system is going to take a lot of time unsupervisedly. So let's um, talk a little bit about the definition and the problem um, description. So um, this is essentially a lifelong learning kind of uh, paradigm. And uh, this concept was introduced in 1995 or 1996. And essentially the idea is this, at any point, a learner has learned a sequence of tasks, uh, one up to N. And when faced with the N plus one task, and use the knowledge gained from the N previous task to help learn the N plus one task. So this is a very simple uh, definition, of course. And uh, obviously this is not enough um, when we come to uh, facing the real world because we really need to close the loop. Because in this definition, we don't know where the tasks come from and we don't know where the training data come from, okay? And also we don't talk so much about how do you accumulate the knowledge. Okay? So it's not sufficient for, that definition is not sufficient for um, autonomous system. And the key question is how do we deal with the open world settings, right? You could come up the sort of a learner, which is uh, somebody give the something to this system, it learns it. And there was a training data with the task and you, you learn it. But when you actually go to, go to the real world, and this is not gonna be enough, okay? So where, are the tasks, where do the tasks come from? It can be given by the human, and uh, it can also be discovered by the system itself. And we'll see some examples. And of course, in the, in the, even in the car kind of examples, you are, you, you are uh, see, for example, and uh, when you come to, for example, this, this guy has learned the, um, the buses, how to recognize bus, how to recognize the pedestrians, how to like the bicycles, but then sudden something, a squirrel comes up and uh, what are you gonna do about it, okay? Um, where do the training data come from? And again, we're trying to say, it possible come from humans. And uh, of course, it's also um, possible to obtain by system itself and by systems active um, action itself. And so autonomous agents um, need to close this loop. Okay, you need to close this loop in order to behave sort of properly in the open world where um, everything goes. Okay, we cannot expect something has to be in certain way. Right? So instead of giving a formal definition that actually has no formal definition, I'll just give a um, a diagram. So in the traditional definition will be um, the top part, which essentially says a set of a sequence of tasks. And uh, each task has its own training data. And then at this moment, we're talking about N plus one's task. And that task has the data as well. The training, for example, a supervised um, data, supervised training data. Then that goes to the um, machine learning algorithm. And this machine learning algorithm is not just traditional machine learning algorithm, it's able to take uh, prior knowledge. Okay, it has to take prior knowledge. And now what you learned can put into knowledge base some, somehow and also can feedback to the, um, to the, to the learner um, in order to learn better or to learn with not, without a lot of training examples. Then this of course goes to the model, if the model produced, and then it goes to the um, uh, the application. So here the two applications that put down here is one of course is the um, self-driving cars, another one is chatbots. And here I put two interactions, interaction with a human, interaction with the, um, with the environment. So how do we close the loop? We basically use three orange colored lines to close the loop. Okay, so when you come to the application, then you can gain some training data and uh, you can also discover some new task which um, you have not learned before. And now you want to learn this particular task. And again, we talk about the interaction because when some 
this and when the chatbot whatever you find something uh, it can't be absolutely sure okay it can't be absolutely sure so some kind of interaction with humans or something else i can confirm this is something new we should learn it or this is a new piece of data because of some kind of supervision from human beings and in the process of learning uh, sorry in the process of application um, the system may also gain some knowledge which can be um, a for, can be fit into this knowledge base and then can be used again. And so this is essentially the, the, the process. So what are the key characteristics? And the first one is the continuous learning process. And this first thing, of course, we want to learn without forgetting. Okay, you don't want to learn one new thing and then forgot the, the past. And the, which is not, um, it's not really reflected in the, in the figure, but uh, it has to be reflected in the algorithm itself. Yeah. And then the next one is knowledge accumulation, um, the, which is essentially like a long-term memory and uh, using and transfer past knowledge uh, to help learn new tasks and also to solve new problems. For example, when you hit a particular situation you are not familiar with, uh, for some self-driving cars and then the self-driving car has to somehow react so for example in, for humans we just slow down and then we try to figure out from the past knowledge you know what to do you can't just stop in the middle of the road and uh, then from that process you can accumulate something data and task and to learn that and in the future when you come to same sim situation you are not going to panic all right so the next thing is learning on the job and during model application, we're talking about this thing um, in the process of application. And how do you do this learning in a self-supervised and the interactive way, okay, interactive way. Okay. So what do we mean by this learning on the job? Of course, just says we discover a new task and the learners okay, incrementally, incrementally without sort of completely disrupting the system, retrain the whole thing from, from, uh, from scratch. And there's no this assumption. We call this um, interactive self-supervision, which basically means uh, people are taking some initiatives and uh, to interact with the environment with the, with the people in order to confirm things which are um, which are important. And also, we need to perform online uh, learning. And uh, um, so essentially, this kind of system, you you have some basic capabilities. And as time goes by, um, you see more things. You you get more uh, training data. You become more um, more sort of intelligent, uh, more knowledgeable. And learning on the job is also something which is studied um, in social science and the learning science. And according to social science, the 70% of human knowledge come from on the job learning and the only 10% from formal education or training. And uh, so of course, another 20% come from um, this observation of others, which essentially Imitation, for example, in the self-driving cars, this happens all the time. And uh, if, uh, for, ex for instance, you see something, um, plastic bag is flying um, in the sky and basically around the car. Then you, if you see other people just drive through that, and then you probably can drive through as well. So it basically means that thing is not very dangerous. Um, so we just want the agent to do the same thing and uh, do the applications and uh, it, because it's just impossible to learn everything offline and uh, by a bunch of engineers and uh, was uh, lots of uh, labelers of, uh, uh, to label the data. So here are the steps. We just have to discover the novel instances um, when we um, actually, in the, when we are in the application, we have a model, we need to discover the novel instances first. And then from that novel instances, um, we have to somehow figure out um, whether there's something unseen classes, okay, those unseen classes, and this becomes difficult. And this is probably you need some kind of interaction with people. For example, you see, um, you, you probably learn to, uh, learn to recognize different kind of animals, but there's a new animal comes, shows up, you think this is something you've never seen it before. And you might just say, okay, I just learned this guy myself. But next time when you something similar to this thing, do you know it's similar or not? But the human being can tell you this probably belong to the, to the same class. And then you can learn them together. You can learn together. So some kind of supervision um, it, it will be needed. At the same time, we need to gather training data. Okay, training data. So um, in, certain, in certain situations, it's not difficult. For example, in the 
um, in image in image domain. So probably just take some pictures of that thing. Okay, take some pictures, and then after that we have new task. We have to learn um, in a continual learning fashion, uh, incrementally adding new classes or incrementally adding new tasks. Okay, adding new tasks, and of course here I have not talked about a major issue is how do you react when you see um, a strange situation. Right? So in a self in a self driving car, this is going to be difficult because um, for humans, even for humans, this can this can be quite difficult. You probably want to slow down and then observe and figure out what to do next. And in in chatbot, it's not it's not that difficult. You just say I don't know, right? Just that's it. I, I and then I just basically log this particular problem and then somebody else is going to fix it. Okay. And then we talk about, um, I really mentioned this many, many times, just the interactive self-supervision. Um, we need to have natural language interface with systems. And which is now possible, okay, which is not possible because we got so many chatbots um, for solving specific tasks and also uh, chatbots for general discussions. And in self driving car, you can just ask the passenger, right? But there are always passengers over there. And uh, for example, you say, "What's that? Pro what's that object?" And I'm mean, listening before. Okay, and how do I do now? Okay, what do I? How should I do? How do I drive? And uh, should I, where should I stop? And so, for example, when you come to the big shopping shopping place, I mean, people can't really tell you x y coordinates. That's the place you stop. But right? probably will just tell you, "Now go straight and the park somewhere near." You know that. Sort of uh, you know whole food shop or something like that. Yeah. So it has to interact with people anyway. Okay, in, uh, with, uh, with people anyway. So of course you also get from um, uh, environment. Okay, but getting it from the environment, um, it sometimes can be dangerous in some situations. Okay, some situations. And uh, but if you just use a search tools, um, search engines, these things probably okay. But if you just get the environment kind of feedback in the self driving cars. And then you got to be very careful. Don't hit people. Don't don't basically damage the car itself. And that means you need an internal uh, evaluation system. Human being has a very rich set of evaluation. We know what is good for us, and uh, in order to survive, you know, to benefit from um, from all the situations. And uh, essentially, is to try to gather knowledge and solution and uh, the reward information. So here is an example. I say example um, is a greeting bot um, in a hotel. So for example, this this guy uh, basically stationed um, in the lobby of the hotel, and now when I see a, a guest, it just basically say something. So for example, he sees an he um, sees a known sort of existing guest. They say John, and how are you today? All right? When he sees a new guest, the bot must recognize the guest is novel. Okay, never seen it before. Then say, okay, welcome to our hotel, and uh, what's your name, sir? All right. For example, the guest may say, okay, I'm David, and uh, the, the bot can definitely take some pictures and uh, learn David to recognize David automatically and uh, incrementally as well. Okay, so when the David show up next time, and uh, then the bot could say, hello, David, and uh, how are you today? I mean, it becomes, you know, I recognize the guest or our friends. So you can see this is essentially a closed loop, and uh, you don't really need any human. Um, intervention, and you can learn in this process without any issue. Okay, without any issue. I think this is doable even now. So um, I'll just give us a few um, glimpse of the um, techniques we have been working on, and uh, I'm, I'm not claim this is going to cover everything because a lot of people have been working on uh, various problems. Okay, various problems. The first thing is how do you detect um, novel instances? Okay, there's a major program in DARPA which is uh, basically focusing on this particular problem now. Um, so we have this, we've been dealing with this problem in uh, 2016. Uh, we started to deal with this 2015, 16. And this is the one with the algorithm in you know, deep learning. Our previous algorithm was not based on deep learning. And uh, this is, um, it's, uh, essentially it's a CN uh, network and then um, the the only difference is is on the on the heads the final classification heads. So traditional CN, you when you do the classification, you use um, uh, cross entropy. And uh, in this case, we don't use cross entropy. We use sigmoid heads, and uh, it does one versus the rest. So essentially, each class, each each of these heads, 
just do classification on that, recognize that particular class of class of objects, right? And then if the CN, if none of those heads can recognize the, the object, supposed to recognize then it's come from somewhere else. So it's not, uh, it's not the recognized object. So it's always something new. Um, so in this case, we need a threshold. And so we need, we need some kind of a Gaussian fitting um, based on the, uh, based on the, basically those are probabilities. And then um, find some kind of a cutoff um, based on those kind of skewed data kind of thing to find a threshold. And the threshold is going to um, basically serve as the rejection or exception, accept uh, kind of uh, um, a cutoff. And this is um, a meta learning based algorithm is something quite related to um, nearest neighbor. We train a nearest neighbor kind of classifier. And this is not exactly nearest neighbor, but it's a, um, it's a bunch of things. It's not just one thing. So we maintain a dynamic set of same class examples and allow the new class to be added in. So this include continued learning as well. So when you have a new thing to, to learn, you basically add some instances, some good instances about that new thing and put into um, that set uh, to represent that particular class. And also, of course, we can delete it. And each class represents a small, with a small set of examples and testing. And uh, we use that meta classifier. Meta classifier is learned from a lots of tasks in the past, okay, in the past. And that meta classifier um, can basically classify um, the examples on the fly and uh, also can do um, rejection as well and tell you based on this bunch of example and measure the distance. This is a trained class of a measure distance and see whether this in or is out. Okay, this is uh, uh, another algorithm. There are many algorithms now. So I'll give you another one, which is uh, continual learning. So that is essentially to try to, how do you recognize a novel instance you've never seen it before. And then you remember there's another step is try to figure out the classes, whether there's some classes, sort of clusters in the novel instances that might be, um, you might be seeing different kind of animals. And how do you know they are different? Okay, so um, people use, we, we try to use clustering to do that, but uh, the, the result was not great. Okay, so not many people have been, been trying that particular problem because it's quite, quite tough. It's quite tough for somehow we probably need some supervision and uh, you can't be done completed unsupervised. It's very difficult, at least very difficult to do completely supervised. So next one, I'll talk about the continual learning. So you, when you recognize something new and you know the classes, for example, somebody, for example, people tells you, and then how do you learn that incrementally? Okay, you have new, you have new classes or you have new task. You, how do you learn that incrementally? So I will just give you an example here. So continual learning is just, the same thing as we defined before, learns a sequence of tasks. And in the past, um, continuing learning has been focusing on uh, dealing with catastrophic forgetting. It means essentially when we, when we uh, play with uh, neural nets and uh, when something changes, when you have a new thing to learn that you're gonna change the weights of the existing network, now you're gonna disrupt the, the things which is uh, you learned in the past and then you uh, have problem, okay. Now you're gonna forget about the problem. So the, the reason is very simple because the, the, what you have learned in the past, which is dis discriminative for the past tasks. When you learn a new task, that discriminative information is no longer valid. When you add this new task, then you obviously have to have to revise. When you revise, you can screw up things um, in, a, in, a, uh, in a network. But we also want to learn sort of uh, um, by, to improve Okay, how do we use the past knowledge to improve the future? Okay, so you want to transfer forward and you also want to transfer backward. So with the new task you learn and you, based on the past knowledge, you can learn better. And also at the same time, this new task can help you to improve what you have learned in the past. Okay, to make the model in the past to perform better as well. So here is an example of um, how do you do that? Okay, here is we have a bunch of tasks. Which the task itself is a, um, is a sentiment classification, for example. Okay, we want to classify a review of documents which has opinions, and then we want to say it's a positive or it's a negative. Okay, for example, we talk about these two classes, but in different domains, you have to use that own data, their own data to train that model. Okay, the, you cannot use one domain and train one, and then you use for other domains because 
they are different. Okay, they're different in, in many ways. Anyways, so how do we learn this thing in a, as a sequence of tasks? Okay, as a sequence of tasks. Okay. So this model is essentially based on the hard attention. Okay, how do you block things which are not useful to you or maybe harmful to you? And, uh, and then you can sort of focus on those part, which is the past, past knowledge, which is useful to you. And then you want to learn better and also at the same time to improve the past. Okay, so the algorithm here essentially is a work side by first to find, uh, when you have a new task, you already have the knowledge base here. Okay, you have really knowledge base, which is basically learned in the past. And then we want to figure out what are the things which we should be using and what should what kind of thing we should be blocking. Okay, so those things we should, we want to block certain things because you don't want to make the past task go bad, okay, go back. So that's the called accessibility um, mask. We build a mask to say, to block out those things and uh, to, to release certain things. So we can, when we actually come to learn this new task, and we can sort of use that part which is useful to us and also at the same time improve the past. Okay, essentially that's, the, that's essentially the idea. So you can transfer knowledge forward and transfer knowledge backward. So here's some, some results, here's some results. You can see um, the backward transfer, backward forward, you also have some kind of some improvement in the future. So this is a forward transfer, it basically says, when I learn this particular task, I can use the past, and when I learned this thing, I got this particular accuracy, okay? And uh, after I, some other tasks being learned in the future, and when I come back to test my model in the past, I, it got better, okay, it gets better, all right? That's essentially the, the idea. Um, another thing we tried was um, improving the model performance um, during application. So. As we mentioned in the classic paradigm, when the model is built, you just apply it and you don't change the model anymore, okay, um, until you have next round of batch training. But how do we improve the model um, during the application process, or at least to improve the performance of the model in application process, okay? So here, in this particular work, we're trying to use um, model output to serve as some useful knowledge, which can be used by the model itself Okay, so when you, when you have a model, you are going to apply on the data and that is going to produce some results. So can we use that result as some kind of knowledge? Okay, and to help the model to do better in the future. And that's essentially the problem. But of course, the major challenge is how do you judge that output is correct? Okay, and this is the major grand challenge. You know, how do you know something you have produced is correct? If it's not correct, then it's going to be bad, and the, because the, the error is going to propagate, and the, it gets worse and worse. Okay, but if you can, if we can to some extent, to great extent, of course, we need to be fairly sure. Now we can leverage that result to improve our model during application. So basically, as I do more and more, I'm getting better and better. Okay, it's not the fixed model anymore. Okay, it's not the fixed result anymore. So we, we did this one with uh, uh, CRF in the information extraction um, application. Um, so the idea is, is it basically try to connect the features with the extraction result. You know the uh, CRF has lots of feature functions. So feature functions, um, if the feature function is rich, and then, then your prediction will be more, much more reliable. So if, how do you make it rich? And we want to use some results from the extraction, and we are pretty sure of those things, and to feedback to the features. So you, now we, we could, could have much more feature as we go along, okay? As we apply our model in the process, we did a lot of extraction, and that extraction result can be used as features in the future. Okay, and uh, so this paper, this paper essentially exploits the dependency relation to say things are related, and then if something is discovered, then the related stuff might be discovered as well. Okay, so this is, and uh, if you can do this, and uh, you can produce better result. But how do you know the, the result you extract is correct? Okay, so in this case, of course, we use some, some kind of heuristic, and they essentially say this, if this particular kind of extraction has been extracted in many domains, okay, in different kind of environment, 
and this is probably correct. It's when we had a high probability, um, it's a correct extraction. And then we can use that to help us to produce better performance and using the same model. In this case, we don't really change the model. It just gets features become richer and richer. Okay. So finally, I'll talk about this the topic of uh, continuous learning in dialogues. Okay, continuous learning in dialogues. Um, so dialogue systems now, um, we use quite a lot of uh, knowledge base um, that in order to do something which is very accurate kind of response, produce um, real accurate response. Because if you just use that um, uh, deep learning, um, you're probably not, not great. Okay, it's not really great. Um, so, but the knowledge base is inherently uh, incomplete and uh, you obviously can put more and more inside to, to make the knowledge richer and richer and uh, so that you can answer more and more questions. So we, we produce, we uh, propose this system called the SOC, Continuous Interactive Learning of Knowledge in Dialogue Systems. And how do we sort of um, question, sort of not question, but basically asking the user to give us certain information in order to gain more knowledge and in order to go forward, to become more knowledgeable, and also at the same time, to be able to answer user's queries, which we would not be able to answer previously. So human knowledge, uh, I think the human conversation um, is mainly knowledge driven, knowledge driven. So for this is an example, um, one user said, I watched the, the Dark Knights yesterday, it was awesome. And then this person has some knowledge about this Christian Bale acted in this um, particular movie. And then he said, did you like Christian Bale's acting? So you can see the knowledge helps um, this conversation to generate this particular conversation, this utterance from the second user. So how can we do this? How can we use this and in, in our learning process? So this is another example. And they say, this person says, hey, um, I visited Stockholm uh, last week. The place is awesome. And uh, then this, for example, this is the user or is the agent. Okay, for example, it's agent. And uh, the, the, the place, um, the agent doesn't really know this place. They just say, where is Stockholm? And they stock, the person says, the Stockholm is the capital of Sweden. Then just learn this thing. And then next time, uh, somebody else says, I'm planning for a Europe tour soon. And then the user, um, or the user two or this particular agent can say, oh, are you visiting Stockholm? And they heard the place has a lot of attractions. So you can see um, what you have you learned and you can carry forward uh, to make your conversation in the future uh, much richer. Okay, especially when we talk about this internet kind of environment, you have so many people talking with a single agent, for example, and then um, you have lots of chance to, to learn something. And so what are the opportunity um, to learn something um, in conversations? So the first thing is you can extract knowledge from the user utterances. Okay, for example, they said Obama was born in Hawaii. Then you can extract that, right? This is basically a piece of knowledge which is uh, probably gonna be useful when somebody else asks in the future. You can also ask a question when you uh, don't know and you're expecting some correct answers. So you can say, where was Obama born? And then the user may say, okay, um, Obama was born in Hawaii. Okay. And then this, obviously you can use this future as well. Even this question may not come from you, it could be from the user, but previously you couldn't answer this particular question. But now you can ask this particular question to some other users to expect some other people knows about this answer, the answer to this question. And then you can save that and then you can move forward. Now you become more knowledgeable. Another situation is when the agent couldn't answer a user question and then is it possible to um, ask the user certain supporting facts and then infer the answer. Okay, infer this answer. We will try to do this situation because this pretty much include both um, these two cases. Um, so here is the um, problem formulation essentially. And this is just one of the papers we, we did was uh, just essentially says where a WH kind of question. So essentially say uh, something and something, something and something else has a relation, but I don't know what that something else, else is. For example, where was Obama born, right? Uh, I, I need to look for a location. Um, then this, we have two goals. The first thing when you answer the user query, if you can, and uh, otherwise you reject, 
Okay, it's just how do we answer this user query? For example, of course, simplest case is that the query, the answer is actually in the knowledge base, but it could be the case is not in the knowledge base or you cannot, they, they could be some, somehow linked in knowledge base, but currently you can't do it. And in that case, can we acquire some knowledge? Basically we call it supporting facts from the user um, to answer um, the, 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 because to answer this particular query. So there's two kinds of situations as well. Like one is called the closed world query and another is open world query. Closed world query basically means the, the H and T, they are all uh, in the knowledge base. They are really known to the knowledge base. And also in this situation, and the thing is not in the knowledge base. For example, the closed world query could be, um, where was Obama born? And then you know Obama is in the knowledge base and uh, the born in is a relation you know as well in the knowledge base. And then you can, this is becomes a closed world query, okay? And because it's inside the system. But uh, the open world query basically says, um, oh, where was Obama born? You don't even know Obama, what Obama was. Okay, then in this case, you gotta ask, you know, what, what is, who is Obama or what is Obama? Okay, and then you can um, gain something from the user um, in order to answer this query. At the same time, um, you also um, sort of accumulate some knowledge. So here's the example. I'm not going to talk about the mechanism. The mechanism is pretty complicated. Um, so in this case, the user says, where, um, in what country is Boston located? All right, you go through this semantic parsing, whatever to produce that um, set of triples and say, this is essentially the question. And then you go to the system and the system um, sort of play around and couldn't figure out what the answer was. And then it has to go uh, to tell you to, to ask the user, basically to have dialogue act, to ask for clues and uh, ask for entity, how do you link that to the existing knowledge base and the generate knowledge, gen, gen, uh, generate sort of a natural language utterance and uh, to give to the user. And so, for example, in this case, I don't know what the located in country mean. And uh, can you provide me an example? So let's see this site, okay, let's see site. The user says, in what country is Boston located? Okay, this is the, um, the representation in, in triples. And then the soup, the system said, I don't know what located in country mean, and uh, what do you provide me? Can you provide me an example? So the guy says the London is located in the UK, and then this is in this format, and they got it, and then can you tell me a fact about Boston? So the, probably the user said Boston, um, and there's the Harvard University is located in Boston, and then the, the soup can say, okay, now I know uh, Boston is located in USA. So, so these are the supporting facts we gain, we can save in the knowledge base. And possibly we can save the last thing as well in the knowledge base. Of course, in this case, it's probably not so safe because your yeah, inference can make mistakes. But this problem is not difficult to solve because later on you can ask somebody else. Okay, you are, since we are, we are talking about the multi-user environment, then you can always talk to other people. Okay. Can I interrupt you with a question there? Yeah. Um, so your example has a, um, Kind of more specific fact that can be used to allow the system to answer the question. And so I, yeah. I would say that this example is completely unrealistic because if you knew that Harvard University uh, was located in Boston, which, you know, okay, we'll quibble about that part, but it seems very unlikely that you would, would want to ask this question in what country is Boston located to begin with. Um, and so I wonder, but, the, but I'm not just trying to pick on your example. I'm just trying to say that um, if, you're, if your system is requiring that the, the user that it's interacting with have, um, uh, you know, kind of sufficiently specific knowledge uh, in order to get this more general fact, right. that seems like, a, like a, a problem. And like, I guess the question is, what if you couldn't actually ask the user about this kind of uh, uh, clarifying question? Um, I, I, I don't really think this is a big problem. The, the major reasons we are not talking to a particular one user because we may not get the answer from this user, but later I can ask the same question to other users, right? We are talking about a multi-user environment. Sure, but you could, just, you could just ask the question that the user is asking that you don't know the answer to, right? Why bother asking, why bother the, the, you know, trying to you know, ask for a fact. Why not just ask some other user in what country is Boston located? You could just like parrot the exact. But in that case, you cannot answer the user's query right away, right? You have to wait for some time. Somebody may 
tomorrow somebody show up to tell you, oh, okay, Boston is okay. Yeah, the US that's true if you ask for a fact about Boston too. From yeah. Audience. Yeah, but uh, you know, that's also a possibility I can answer right away, right? No. In this case, you needed a clarifying question in order, in order to answer right away. And I'm saying it's yeah, but user, the, the, ask, the case, actual user asking may, user. may give me something which is useful to me. I can, I can infer the Boston is in USA, right? Yeah, I just don't think that the important information that they would have would give you that because otherwise you would know. Anyway. Um, I mean, yeah, maybe, I understand that. What are you, what are you trying to say? You, you may, the users probably don't really have that specific piece of knowledge. But the user doesn't really have to say Harvard University, right? You can say some other things, right? Whatever things you can say, I might be able to use that to, to, to close my inference chain, right? I guess so, but you would have to have some fact that somebody who doesn't know that Boston is located in the USA would yet know about Boston, which seems unlikely. Um, but somebody may know Harvard University is in Boston, right? Um, I mean, I, I mean I, this, I, I'm not saying this example is perfect, but personally, I feel it's okay. I mean, um, probably I, will, I want to show, uh, you, you might be thinking you have a different example or something like that. Well, yeah, an example could be like, you know, does this medicine interact poorly with grapefruits? Okay, well, I don't know what it means to interact poorly with grapefruits, right? right. Or, or something like that. Can you give me an example? You say, well, warfare interacts poorly with grapefruits. Okay, great. Can you tell me something about this, me like a, a aspirin? Can you tell me something about aspirin? Yeah, aspirin is used to cure headaches. Now, if you could then figure out whether or not aspirin interacts badly with, uh, with grapefruit, uh, from that information, that, all, that conversation seems much more realistic to me. Uh, sure, sure, sure. I think sure. it's much harder to actually yeah, yeah. To do. I, I understand. Sure, sure, sure. I mean, I just want to make this example simple, right? Yeah, I understand. Yeah, you probably not the best example. Right. And, and I want to uh, mention briefly that uh, this is a very good point, uh, but we are starting to approach the noon uh, hour. So I wanted to give Bing a, a, a chance to finish up. And uh, I would definitely encourage uh, discussion after the meeting. Uh, I'm not, I'm, I think this is a very good point. I, I'm just saying that in the interest of time. But thank you again, uh, Bing, and thank you again, uh, uh, John. Okay, I'll finish it. And um, I don't really have many slides left. Only two, two or three. Okay. Um, so essentially, we need some components. Obviously, we need a knowledge base with the interactive module, interaction module to um, to generate the questions, to to talk to the people, and then we also have the inference. When we have some facts, can we infer? Can we close that chain to 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 basically get the answer? Okay. Um, so I want to just one slide, just one slide, basically say, um, just now we're talking about how do you learn knowledge, but also we can learn language, okay, learn language. So recall just now I said, self-driven car detect a small stone on the road and they just refuse to move. And in that case, um, you can interact with passengers. And uh, when you interact with passengers, you gain some supervised, inf supervisory information, then you probably learn in that case. So in this case, we, knew, we need the natural language interface. So in that natural language interface, um, and we also need to learn language because different people may say the same thing in, in different ways. And there's even the same people say different time in a minute in different ways. So obviously it's very difficult to, to include all the possible ways when you build your system. And how do you learn when you see, uh, when you heard some sort of novel expressions, which is expressing certain things, okay? So how do you do that? Learning, um, continuous learning, this new natural language expressions, which is basically talk about the same thing, and how do you ground them um, to appropriate actions? So this is another thing I'm not gonna talk about. If you're interested, you can take a look at this particular paper and how do we how do, we do that? Okay. Um, so I'm gonna finish up with the, um, with the summary. Um, so uh, the classic machine learning, um, as we said, is kind of isolated, closed world, and a single task kind of learning. Of course, we can do multitask learning, but multitask learning is exactly the same thing as the classical model, because finally you you are essentially still um, optimize a, you know some of the losses of the every guy. But you can treat that as a single task; it's no problem, right? But however, in the real life, that's not the case. You can't do multitask learning. You cannot learn everything in the world when you see something new. Relearn everything in the world when you see something new. You have to learn continuously in an incremental way. 
And uh, also you must learn to recognize stuff you have not seen it before, and which is essentially the process of learning on the job while you're doing things, okay? And uh, so the, the message is you got to be um, actively initiate kind of interaction in order to get some supervisory information. And then we can close the loop and to learn things sort of uh, in a self-supervised way, um, become uh, sort of autonomous. And, uh, and currently that, that this, this kind of different areas that a bunch of people working on each of these areas. I'm just putting this thing together. And then um, when we deal with this problem, we have some major challenges. We have major challenges, uh, current techniques, of course, they are still pretty rudimentary. And uh, one of those challenges is the correctness and application, applicability of knowledge. So when you, when you learn something, how do you know that thing is correct? And how do you know, even that thing is correct here, how do you know it's correct there? You know, when you, when you come to a new thing, how do you know that is applicable in a new place? Okay, and I have not mentioned this knowledge representation, the reasoning stuff, because a lot of things when you actually want to respond, for example, when the car comes to a situation, doesn't know what to do, then you have to reason, because that time you cannot just say, you know, learn something and then you do, you have to reason to somehow get out of that situation in a reasonable way, okay? And the self-motivation, composition, that's another thing, you learn a lot of things, how can, you, how can you compose that together? We talk a little bit about this uh, interactive learning already. And uh, that's pretty much what I have. And uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'll be happy to answer questions. Uh, thank you again, Bing. Uh, I have a question, but before I ask mine, I would like to see if there's anyone else who would like to answer, ask a question. Sure. Uh, okay, uh, uh, so in that case, I'll just ask my question before uh, our time is up. Um, and that question is related to um, how to deal with, um, uh, I, I think this relates to the very last point you made in your summary slide, which is how do you deal with um, uh, uh, a new knowledge which is incorrect, noisy, or maybe um, uh, purposefully wrong? Uh, for example, in the uh, Maybe a good example of, of continuous learning would be K from the, the Microsoft uh, Twitter bot, uh, which learned to be racist very quickly due mm -hmm. to injection of new knowledge, which was intentionally bad. Mm -hmm. um, how, how does one try to differentiate um, uh, sort of more correct and less correct knowledge? Yeah. Um, so there were, there was some research, I mean, that's, Basically, the different issues are here. You could be whether that thing is trustworthy, you know, whether that thing is, is good, um, or whether something is correct. There's a different things. Um, there's some issue, there's some sort of database research did a little bit of how do you detect the truth of this particular knowledge, and then in in this, um, uh, if I want to focus on this dialogue kind of environment, and what do we do now is, uh, um, I mean, uh, it's not what we do now, but what we are thinking of doing is uh, more of uh, you don't save a lot of knowledge uh, prematurely in the knowledge base. So you want to put that in the cache and then, you know, confirm with various people. If you think about this is a huge environment with a lot of people, then you're probably um, able to do that. And then for those things which are really correct, and you're pretty sure are correct, then you're saving the knowledge base. Um, I think that way should be reasonably okay. I mean, another situation, of course, I mean, even you have not, uh, wrong knowledge is not a problem, right? I mean, human beings have so many wrong knowledge in, your, in everybody's mind, brain. That's a very good point. Um, and although I do have some more questions about that, I will ask you uh, during our one-on-one -on -one meeting. Um, mm -hmm. Is uh, Maybe we have time for just one more question. I didn't want to sort of dominate the discussion. I, mean, I can ask one, but I already asked a question, so. Totally, no, uh, we, well, since it's a little after 12, uh, I think we can talk offline. Hopefully, John, you'll have a one-on-one -on -one meeting sure. with Dan. Uh, so in any case, um, uh, with that, I think uh, I wanna thank you again, Bing, for this discussion. It was very productive. Um, and also, uh, Amy, if you're recording, I think we can stop recording now. And I hope you have a good day, Bing, and I hope to talk to you soon.